Uh, hi everyone, Ian Hamilton here, broadcasting to a live YouTube audience from Virtual Reality. I'm expressing myself wearing a Quest 2 headset with software made by my colleague. He lives in a completely different part of the world, and I've never met him in physical space. Yet we feel like we're sitting together in this studio to bring you the latest news and analysis about VR. If you're watching this live, we can respond to your comments as you just helped us out. And please help us out by liking and sharing the VR download with your curious friends and family. My co-host is David Heaney. What do we have for our audience today? We have quite a lot to talk about today. We'll talk about the fact that the Quest 2 retail packaging in Japan now shows Meta, at least that's what one source indicates. We'll talk about the training and rewards program Meta is launching for Horizon Worlds. We'll talk about Meta's commitment to improving the Quest's video recording features by May. We'll discuss the shipping update for Lynx, the independent French standalone mixed reality headset. And we'll talk about two different acquisitions in this space, Google acquiring a company called Raxium and Snapchat acquiring a company called Nextmind. And finally, to top it off, we'll talk about the impressions and details that we've got about PlayStation VR 2 from GDC. So there was some impressions of people who got to try it and a little bit of details about the foveated rendering system on there, which of course everyone's very interested to hear about. Leo, yeah, let's get in right into that first bit of news. Meta packaging was spotted in Japan. So uh, as was explained last year, basically, they're changing over the branding on the Quest 2 over to Meta branding. And this is continuing a, a very long process. We actually reached out to Meta just to confirm. And they said, quote, yes, as we shared previously, we will be shifting to the Meta Quest brand for our VR hardware. And this will take place gradually over time on different sur to surfaces, including the product packaging, as we move to the new brand architecture. So, Heaney, what does this mean for our readers out there, our listeners? So I don't think this means much on its own, but it, it's a long pattern of a slow, gradual change to phase out that Oculus branding and replace it everywhere possible with Meta's overall corporate branding. We saw it recently with the boot up startup screen of Quest 2 changing from the Oculus logo to the Meta logo. We've seen the website change the Meta Quest branding. We saw a few months ago the Twitter and other social media branding change to Meta Quest. In general, Meta is trying to completely erase the Oculus brand, which I don't think we've actually seen this happen on an existing product before, at least not a kind of large scale consumer tech product where the actual brand that it's coming from changes while it's still on the market to the point where they have to go and change the box to tweak it. I don't think that's something we've seen before. And it's it's yet to be seen whether this will actually have, at least in the short term, a negative impact on sales. Because will people who would have recognized the Oculus brand in a store or while shopping around recognize Meta as much? Or do only people who follow tech news actually know that Facebook has changed its name to Meta and that that's what that means? Yeah, I'm seeing in our comments a lot of people sort of mourning the loss of the Oculus brand right at their boot boot up of the Quest headset. So I just want that on the record of just the heartbreaking feeling some people have of just turning on their headset for the first time and seeing that kind of history erased right in front of their very eyes and replaced by this new brand architecture, as Meta put, puts it. Uh, anything else here that we should respond to, Hina, before we move on to the next subject? Yeah, I'll just have a look at the comments here. I don't think there's much to say on this topic just because it is such a small change overall. It's really just something we wanted to note because of that larger overall trend. Techno Glitch saying they can't stand the Meta logo on their boot up, boot up screen and it's it's junk. I kind of agree with that. It's not a very aesthetic logo, is it? Because it's not, there's something just slightly off about it. It looks like a kind of droopy infinity sign. So it really isn't the most aesthetic brand logo, is it? <laughs> Yeah, we can wait another 10 years where they'll probably change the logo, but they won't change the name again, right? Oh, yeah, it seems corporations do that all the time. Vargo soft pointing out that when their Quest 1 booted up with that meta logo, uh, they nearly cried. That's that's quite the reaction there. But if you're familiar with the Oculus brand for years, that's something that isn't unexpected. It's it, Again, it really hasn't been anything like this in recent history for tech companies. There's this fundamental question from Techno Glitch asking, when can I sign out of Facebook? And we hear that all the time, and we are putting that question to Meta constantly. I think the answer there is probably, you know, all they've said is that there's going to be new login options, I think is the way it's referred to. 
But, you know, my guess there, Heaney, I could be wrong on this, is you can probably sign out of Facebook when you can sign into Meta, I would, I would think, right? Yeah, it seems likely that they will have an account system for these devices that is separate to the account system for their social network, Facebook. And so the answer to that is, as you say, whenever they create this new Meta account system or whatever it happens to be, that's the point at which you can sign out. Though, you know, I wonder, is it going to be a continuation of the existing Oculus account system, which just, you know, less than a year ago, they were talking about deprecating in favor of the Facebook account system? Let's move on to the next subject. Horizon Worlds uh, is offering, uh, Meta is offering training and rewards to people who are building in Horizon Worlds. So Horizon Worlds is, of course, their NVR tool set that is going up to compete against Rec Room. And uh, maybe to a lesser extent, VR chat, but they're both in the same category. And they're going to offer builders uh, training and a boot camp to build with those tools. We've been watching this over a couple of years. Previously, Meta or Facebook had Oculus Start and Oculus Launchpad, where they were kind of focused on Unity and on real devs. People using these engines from other companies produce to produce their content for Facebook's headsets. Obviously, Horizon Worlds does away with a lot of that. Heaney, can you break this down for our audience a little bit, what this means? Yeah, so this is a continuation, again, of something that's been happening for a while. Uh, it was back in October that Meta announced a $10 million creator fund. The problem with Horizon Worlds from a lot of people have tried it. I still haven't tried it because it's not available outside the US and Canada. But the people I've discussed that have tried it say that there just isn't enough content in there yet for to have something to really do. And it's a chicken and egg problem, isn't it? In that you can't get people in to play content until the content exists, but you also can't get creators interested in building content until there is a large audience of regular users here that are going to create. So Meta has decided that their solution to that chicken and egg problem is was that 10 million creator fund in October. And now recently they've announced this new program, which is that they want to train people in how to build in Horizon Worlds and give out cash rewards of up to $500,000, or sorry, that is the entire kind of funding pot, $500,000. And, you know, Rec Room actually has their own system for monetizing creators. They have their partner creator funds where you get, earn tokens in game. And if you your account qualifies for a certain number of things, you, know, you have to verify you're an adult, you have to have used the service for a certain amount of time, you have to be a Rec Room Plus user, you can actually cash those out. But Meta is going for a different strategy here of just kind of giving creators money and training before the massive users has really arrived into Horizon Worlds so that by the time there is a large number of users coming in here, they already have things to do. But time will tell whether that strategy will really work. On screen here, if you're watching, you'll see just the latest demo video they've shown of a group of people cooperatively recreating something that's very similar to Rec Room's paintball or laser tag in Horizon Worlds. And that's one of the real kind of selling features of Horizon Worlds, what Meta is really pushing is this fact that you can directly in VR cooperatively and at any scale you want, build these worlds with your friends and then jump straight into them. There's no separate like processing or rendering or compiling layer. It's just you're, you create and then you use it instantly. Yeah, I, I wrote a separate article just about this particular video that we've got up here, this time lapse that shows sort of the ground up recreation of a game that looks just like laser tag and paintball from rec room and they fundamentally built this in a cooperative way in vr and it it looks essentially identical i mean it's there are some slight visual differences but it is very very similar to that game in rec room that's been around for more than half a decade now but uh there i i think of this evolution this kind of goes to the very core heart of the kind of business prospect of whether VR can support employing a lot of people in the future. And Rec Room, Roblox, and Meta are in kind of a, a race, so to speak, to, I don't know, enrich or employ their creators, create a new class of, of, of creator, employed creator that goes and actually makes a living off of creating virtual worlds for them. Uh, that kind of sets up a very interesting dynamic over the next few years where, I don't know, Heaney, uh, we kind of got this 
expectation that Meta can outspend these other competitors given their weight and position. But is that really the case? Are they too stuck by other things? And do you think Rec Room is going to be able to raise the amount of money they need in the coming years to compete with what Meta is doing? Well, yeah, as you say, it really all comes down to the creators that each platform can attract because these are not sort of strategies where either Rec Room or Meta wants to build this content themselves. The entire idea of these platforms, these platforms that let you build content in VR is to be more like platforms than predefined games. So no matter how much Meta spends, if it doesn't get creators in there that really care about the platform and really want to continuously over a long time build worlds that people want to actually spend time in in VR, not just come and look at for the first five minutes and then say, oh, that was pretty cool and go play something else. That is the challenge. Rec Room is already there. There are people that build content in Rec Room and make money off it and people genuinely come in to buy those uh, services and use those tokens and they are creating for a real audience. Horizon Worlds is still in this kind of early phase where Meta is still trying to figure out what it even wants to be. It's still adding core features every few months and it still is at that chicken of the chicken and egg problem. So I think you know we can speculate all day long, but it, only time will tell whether people really want to use this platform or whether it ends up just being a kind of second rate Rec Room clone. Yeah, you can kind of see it in the language that the companies are using, uh, even in our comments. You know, are the people who end up making a living creating virtual worlds, are they builders, creators, developers? What Are they freelancers or are they a new, uh, something new, right? And uh, I'm seeing also a comment from Onakazi pointing out that Rec Room didn't develop into what it was overnight and in fact the original i, I want to say the original laser tag and paintball games came from rec room itself they weren't community built uh as i understand it originally and that's why it's so significant significant to see this evolution in this time lapse video from meta because it is a significant uh step that they're able actually to use all these fundamental game mechanics and things that they can copy and build on for future games, right? So uh, Meta's been doing this thing, and I've been toying with whether we call them bounties, right? For these creators to go in and compete for introducing certain mechanics or certain themes to these interconnected horizon worlds. And over time, all of those elements that get built for these competitions should be reusable by other creators and form the building blocks of further more complex worlds down the line pretty significant effort from meta and i know a lot of people like to complain and talk about a a skiva is mentioning you know all those millions and all those efforts and this is what they came up with i i get it i I get that it looks i don't know lagging in the competition in, in in a way but it's it's a really fundamental rethinking of the entire pipeline of content production content production isn't it heaney Yeah, I think that's a really good point to say that Rec Room actually started with a platform where all of the games you played were pre-made by Rec Room. And over time, they actually added these in-VR creation tools that Horizon World kind of emulates and goes a little bit further in. So does Meta need to kind of actually bring in proper game developers first and build out content that people want and then come and try and do this community creation platform? It's obvious they don't want to make that kind of investment because over time they want this to work in the same way that YouTube works for Google. Where you, Google doesn't have a content budget or a, you know, a content department for YouTube. People use it as a platform. Creators upload videos and you know you're kind of saying you know is this a new thing i think if you look back to pl- existing platforms like youtube that is the kind of appropriate analogy to watch they're trying to make happen here except in a virtual reality context i think skiva makes another good comment here in pointing out that one of the real advantages of rec room is that it's available on other platforms horizon worlds is only on quest 2 and rift right now so you know meta has announced its intention to over time come to other platforms, including mobile, by the end of this year. So we're going to need to see whether that works and how those platforms compare when people can play with their friends on the platform of choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good points and great comments sort of adding to this conversation and talking about like, aren't these kind of like a paid internship where it's like a job interview to compete in these competitions? And I think that's fundamentally what we will see over time is uh, people who jump in and use these tools for free initially uh, 
are trying pro- potentially to make contacts with Meta employees and impress them and potentially find a path in, into full-time employment by kind of doing some of that work. And we see this a lot in different industries of that kind of bet on the future um, to invest their time into a new emerging platform. Yeah, we'll still need to see a token system like Rec Room and like Roblox to make this a self-sustaining thing. It needs to be to the point where you as a creator in this can charge money, you know, obviously not directly. They do it through a token medium for obvious reasons, but they you need to be able to get to the point where you can make a map like this and charge people a certain amount of tokens to play or you make some sort of, you know, theater like content where you put on a show and people have to pay tokens to come and use it or even just cosmetic items that are available in these kind of worlds that are paid through these tokens until it gets to that point it's not going to be self-sustaining and it is going to be as you say almost like some sort of bounty system where creators are just competing to try and get prizes like this we're still so early in horizon world's lifetime and it's nowhere near the point of being a self-sustaining financially viable business for any of these creators yet yeah i'm seeing in our comments people talking uh james mentioning sort of exploitation of free labor as one of the ways of criticizing this avenue. Whereas I'm kind of like looking at it from the other end of that, where these organizations like Meta set up KPIs, key performance indicators to track the progress towards specific goals. And there, there is a sense of like, if we have 10 million people in this platform this year, we want to have 20 million people in there next year what percentage of those millions are actually going to be creating and then what percentage of those are going to be making a profit or a living off of that creating. And they have to figure out how to incentivize that growth and make it track so that they, they are the leaders. And it's, it's no easy feat for either Rec Room or Roblox or Meta. We ready to move on to the next subject? Any other comments we should respond to? Yeah, I think we can move on to the Quest video recording promise. Yeah, so this is based on a comment from a Meta employee sort of indicating that they are going to try to improve the video recording capabilities built into the Quest headset by the May timeframe. That can, of course, shift based on a variety of uh, scenarios, uh, things causing that to shift. They even said that they were trying to get it up and running by April, but that might not happen. Whoa, that was wild. Did you all see that? That's he needs, uh, he needs switching from... Uh, controllers to hand tracking and made his arms like eight feet long right in front of me yeah uh this what is the issue here heaney what are the problems with the current recording tools on quest and what can sort of change to make that better so yeah as you say this was prompted by a twitter question from nathy in january and at the time that product manager from Meta said that this was a top priority for our team to deliver on this year. So they said they are excited to get this on our hands ASAP. So Nathy then followed up last week. And the response again from that same employee was that the team is shooting for a May public launch, but chances are high for April. And the problem here is that the current recording tools built into Quest are very basic. The only option is whether you want to record microphone audio or not. By default, it records at 30 frames per second in a square aspect ratio. And the problem is that if you want to increase that to 60 frames per second, or if you want to crop that losslessly to be a widescreen aspect ratio, like 16.9, you need to connect the Quest to your computer and use ADB commands. SideQuest can do this automatically for you, but other, you know, it's still an effort to have to do that given that every time your headset reboots, those commands will be reset and you'll have to remember to go over and kind of manually change those recording settings. So the, we haven't actually heard the detail of what Meta plans to improve in April and May. What are they going to be the actual specifics here? But it's heavily hinted based on what keeps being brought up that it's something to do with widescreen or something to do with higher frame rate recording. The one problem here though is that neither of those come without trade-offs. If you increase the recording frame rate, it puts more stress on the processor, which means the game itself is going to run at a lower frame rate. Sometimes there'll be frame drops. Sometimes there'll be, you know, even multi-second hitches because recording can be quite intensive. And then the problem if you're recording in widescreen is that the Quest's render target is actually square. Each, each eye 
in your Quest 2 or even any similar headset is rendering a square aspect ratio. Now, if you put two eyes together, obviously that's a widescreen. But you know, if you're trying to record for YouTube or to share to someone, you don't want to see two eyes. You want to see one at a time. So what actually happens when you use those tools on SideQuest or ADB commands manually to crop to 16.9 is that it goes from this square, which is shown here in blue, to this 16.9 crop, which is shown in red. Now, this isn't useless because it means you get a lossless cut, a lossless crop down to this widescreen ratio. And it can be more important for games where you're kind of mostly looking at stuff in the distance so that the viewer on their TV or their laptop or their smartphone has a more immersive experience. The problem is that if you're in a game like Gorn, any game where you have close melee combat, you're actually going to miss a lot of your weapon because a lot of it will be down in this corner of the fr this part of the frame and you'll miss the top and bottom of enemies so you won't actually see a lot of the time the head of the enemy that you're attacking because you're so close to them that they're not inside this crop the other problem is in cockpit games if you're in something like warplanes if you're in something like ex machina you're going to miss a lot of the throttle and stick down here and any of the other kind of elements of the cockpit up here in something like a mech game so it'll be interesting to see how meta's official tools handle these trade-offs versus the current situation of ADB commands. Mm, yeah, really excellent point about the cropping there, right? I want the bottom of the field of view almost all the time, right? I hate cutting off those hands because that's where most of the interactions take place and cutting that off can be really jarring. So there's a difficult situation there where they, I, I'm really curious to see if they kind of build a way to I don't know, set it per app. Like that's, I would love to be able to move this square or this rectangle to the bottom or the top, depending on a per app basis or a per recording session basis. But obviously we'll have to see how they, how they roll that out. And Skiven, our comments saying that uh, last week at GDC, he also heard the April timeframe being suggested uh, as, as what they're aiming for. So we should have this very soon. Any comments there we should re respond to Heaney? I actually think what you suggested is a really interesting idea. The idea of being able to choose where your widescreen crop is from kind of all the way at the top of the frame for certain games to, you know, the bottom, for example, in the cockpit titles, it'd be much more useful to see the bottom. It's still going to run into the problem though, where then you're going to be missing a lot of the top. And a lot of the time, something that you think you can see is something that your viewers aren't going to be able to see. So unfortunately, you know, we'll have to wait for wider field of view headsets until we get a true widescreen recording. They could obviously conceivably actually render much wider field of view than is being shown on your display and just record in it, but that would be a lot more computationally expensive because you're going to have to render all of that extra detail. So it doesn't seem likely that that will happen. Or if it did happen, you would probably have to turn down the resolution quite a lot, which would, you know, on Quest 2, we're only just at the boundary of where resolution is acceptable for a lot of games. So I don't think we're quite ready there. The only other thing I want to add here is I was I was messing around with the Facebook View app yesterday because I've got the Ray-Ban Stories sunglasses and uh, lots of little things to realize there were like, if I go and search my Photos app for uh, Ray-Ban Stories, only the images pop up, I think. But if I go and search for View, the, the app that it's in, uh, then all the videos pop up. And all of those, all that content gets copied because I've got the setting active in the Facebook View app that sends all of the, a copy of everything to my photo library. But what I lose in the content going from the app to the photo library is I lose all the built-in editing tools that Meta has gone and made for editing all of that content that's, that's coming out of those sunglasses. The big reason I bring this up is in that app, it's the same ratio, it's the same square video coming out of these sunglasses that we get out of the meta recording features. So there's actually a potential avenue, like it makes a lot of sense to have that, that rectangular recording feature as something you can modify on an app, right? You get the video, the full uncompressed uh, video or yeah, the full lossless video onto your phone, and then maybe you could set up your recording over on the phone. I'd like to see that in the Ray-Ban Stories app as well, because that could be really useful. But uh, obviously, there's some similarity there. And it, it's so cool. I don't know if anyone's done this or tried this, but if you have the story of sunglasses, 
because the aspect ratio is the same, you can film a video of yourself putting on VR glasses and just hit the edit button right there and then put over your VR overlay. And it almost looks like all of those highly produced videos where you're actually going inside the headset with the viewer because the aspect ratios are the same. So I'm, I'm really curious to, to see how they're going to evolve both of both those platforms. Yeah, they definitely need to improve how you handle files as well. Uh, you know, as well as just how the things are recorded. The the Windows app, and I think it's a Mac app as well, Oculus Developer Hub, actually has a great interface for managing all of the videos and images on your Quest and easily transferring them to your PC. One of the really low-hanging fruit I think Meta could do is just build that same interface into the default Oculus PC app that you use to manage Oculus Link. So you plug in your headset, you open the Oculus app, and all of those files are there. Because for YouTube content creators, you know, syncing to their phone isn't really what they care about. That's what consumers care about in terms of sharing, you know, on social media platforms or instant messaging, the videos you've taken from VR. But content creators are plugging their quests into their PC and transferring these files over. And right now, if you're not using the developer hub, which is a tool that is, you know, mainly designed for development, so isn't something that's marketed towards creators, you're still having to kind of manually manage files and worse than that sometimes there's still that bug where the file won't transfer right even though it seems to always work perfectly in sidequest so right now sidequest is still the tool of choice for content creators and until meta starts to really take this flow seriously the entire flow of recording a video in quest to getting it into a video editor sidequest is going to continue to be the tool of choice there i think Mm, yeah, I brought up the Ray-Ban story glasses also because it's just so weird to go into my file system and like not see Facebook listed in the Photos app, right? It's either Ray-Ban stories or it's View. And if I go into the App Store, the View app is from Meta Platforms, but it's just it's mind-numbing that they change the brand of those things the moment they're out the door and they can't even offer like a straight answer right now of whether the wake word is going to change to meta at some point or whether it's just going to stay Facebook because that's like a hardware based thing that they, they can't change what wake words are there on the hardware. But I, I don't know if that's the case. All right. We ready to move on to links. Yep. The only thing I was going to point out is Paradise Decay here in the comments, a YouTube content creator that's saying that the biggest issue for them is the mono sound and it being out of sync with the video. That is a, a huge point. There's still these low hanging fruit bugs that have been around in the quest for so long that make it so difficult to be a content creator because they're going to have to then you know, separate the audio track and sync it manually and then kind of transfer that across all their cuts. If Meta wants these content creators to keep making videos on their platform and actually enjoy doing it. They need to solve these issues. It really should be a higher priority. All right, links, links, mixed reality headset. We got a, a update from between realities. They interviewed Stan LaRoque over there at links uh, last week at GDC who provided an update about their shipping. So they were planning to ship the first units in April. And now they say that they are on, a time frame of June to July to actually release that. So thank you, Skiva and Alex, for getting that news. And Skiva's there in our comments. Uh, very busy week for them at GDC and uh, incredible little bit of news for us to have. And Hini, what do you what do you make of this? So I'm not surprised by this because global supply chains are still an absolute mess right now. And normally when you're backing a hardware Kickstarter or any kind of startup tech hardware company, there's always going to be delays that are caused by the normal, incredible complexity of trying to launch a hardware product. But right now, it's even harder. You know, China in the past few months has had multiple lockdowns of some of the key cities that are used for manufacturing components that go into these kind of products. The kind of demand for tech is still increasing and suppliers are still trying to catch up with demand for chips in things like cars. You know, there's reports that Cars are shipping out with some of the chips missing. I heard that you know Tesla now only has one chip in their steering system rather than two. Some a large American manufacturer, I think it was Ford, has launched vehicles where you know they don't have the rear climate controls because they just didn't have enough chips. Right now is still one of the worst times in the past 20 years to be launching a new piece of hardware as a small company that doesn't have access to large deals. So I know a lot of people are going to be disappointed by this delay, given that it was supposed to ship in April next month. But 
I don't think I can, we can blame Lynx here. This is just an awful time to be trying to launch a product like this. Yeah, and they're not alone, right? That that even other VR headset manufacturers, we have absolutely no idea when they're actually going to launch, given all of these manufacturing issues. So, not a surprise, but it, it also they've changed their price a little bit, right? Heaney, can you recap the pricing evolution for the Lynx Mixed Reality? So yeah, when this was originally announced uh, quite a while ago in early 2020, I believe it was supposed to be a fifteen hundred dollar headset aimed at professionals and not at kind of regular consumers. And then last year, there was a really dramatic shift in strategy from Lynx where they decided to take eye tracking out to come up with a much lower priced product that could actually be shipped and marketed to consumers. And you know, right now, I think the currency conversion comes out to somewhere around $500 for Kickstarter backers. We don't know yet if there's going to be a different price at retail, obviously that's going to depend on a range of factors, but this is now in the realm where it's competitive with Quest 2. Obviously it's $200 more, but there's two kind of major advantages in a headset like this over Quest 2. The first is that because the battery is in the rear, the front can be a lot more compact and it's not just the battery, obviously it's their unique lens design that allows for this. And the other of course, is that where when you're in a Quest 2, you see a grainy black and white view of the real world. This has high resolution color cameras for a kind of realistic view of the real world. And that's why this isn't just marketed as a VR headset. In fact, it's not even how it's primarily marketed. This is marketed as an AR plus VR headset, or some people would say mixed reality. The terminology doesn't matter. The point is you can see the real world in high detail. And of course, the third thing I almost forgot to say is that this has ultra leap hand tracking built in. And, you know, I tried this headset with this ultra leap hand tracking at CES this year, and I was incredibly impressed. It is night and day compared to the Quest 2's tracking. Now, does that make this a mass market product? I don't think so, but it does make it the first affordable mixed reality headset that we know of. It's possible that Meta's Project Cambria later this year will come in at that sort of price point, but I don't think it will because it does have those extra features like eye tracking and face tracking and those very advanced controllers that don't have tracking rings. Just to answer a quick question, just before you come in here, Ian, uh, James O'Loughlin asked, sorry, my comments went away. Sorry, Chris Richardson asked, does Lynx have a gasket that we never see? Yes, there is a optional, uh, well, it's included with the product, but is it, you optionally attach a gasket to the side when you're in VR only mode to block out the real world. But when you're in AR mode, you're probably going to want to prefer to use it like this so that you can see the real world in your peripheral vision and through the headset's optics. Yeah, we had Alex and Skiva in our studio last week. Go check that video out because they have a very long rundown, a very in-depth rundown of the different AR platforms we saw at GDC. So Tilt 5 was something they also uh, got to try out. And they call, you said it doesn't matter, and it doesn't necessarily what matter what terminology we use, but I am so appreciative that Tilt 5 calls their system augmented reality, and then Lynx calls it mixed reality. And they're both owning those terms in very different ways. Because over on the Tilt 5 system, there really isn't a reason to ever put on the blinders and block out the real world and have that become a VR experience. The advantage of the Tilt 5 system is that you get such a clear view of the other people sitting around at a table with you. Whereas in this, you can only see that out the periphery where when you're in uh, yeah, everything in your main vision is provided by the headset and then the periphery out the sides is what you see in AR. So it actually makes sense to call this mixed reality since it's blocking off and then recreating so much of your vision. And most of the, like if you want to use it in strictly VR mode, then you put those blinders on and block it all out and have a VR headset. But most of the time, you're probably going to want to see that environment and want to have that content mixed with it. And it's such a great point where it's going to be weird in a couple of years to have VR headsets that don't show you anything in your in your physical environment that we kind of have today, isn't it, Heaney? Yeah, and I I said many times in this show I think those headsets will go away, and I think that because 
the headsets will have such powerful mixed reality features because the real world will be in color and in high definition and you'll be able to use these mixed reality apps that take place in your real room. I don't think these are going to be called VR headsets in the long term. I think they're just going to be called headsets and VR and mixed reality will be content types that you can use on a headset. So, but I think, you know, when it comes to being a VR headset, because it's not going to have controllers at launch and because by the signs of it, those controllers aren't going to be of the same precision that you see in a Quest 2, this is mainly going to be a mixed reality headset in the sense that there is nothing that you can buy as a consumer that is like this right now. There is nothing that passes through the real world in color that is standalone, that is wireless, that has this inside out tracking, that is all these things together. You can get AR glasses, but you know they have an extremely limited field of view and they're more expensive than this. And the content is almost not there at all. But until Cambria arrives, until Apple arrives, Lynx is, if it manages to launch first and it does meet that June, July timeline, going to be pioneering a new category. And so, you know, a lot of people try to directly compare this to Quest 2. And it's right to say that this is arguably the closest thing to a Quest 2 competitor that we will see anytime soon. It really does stand on its own merit as having a content category that Quest 2 just cannot do properly other than in grainy black and white. Yeah, Chris Richardson mentioned something that I don't really recall, but it, it sounds right, that the Cast AR Kickstarter, the thing that preceded Tilt 5, so it had a whole previous life, as Cast AR, which a company got spun out from Valve as its own independent product, and they Jerry Ellsworth, I think, c carried her patents over from Valve into the new company, did crowdfunding, had a whole life where they raised money. But back when they did their original crowdfunding, they tried to pack in too many features to try to like get the maximum amount they could. And then when it actually came to deliver all of those features in the end device, it cost too much money. Whereas with Tilt 5, they have provided a very focused experience, a very focused product that, we again, we talked about with Alex and Skiva at length, uh, where it's, it seems like a product that is built specifically for tabletop gamers who want to have a extensive multi-hour experience with their friends or family playing like a, an AR version of their favorite board game. And they're providing a product there with Tilt 5 that is exactly that. And people can look at that and go, where's the mass market approach, right? Why do I need four devices to connect to four different glasses? Like that's an absurd expense. But I don't think it is necessarily for that specific use case with that focused effort. And then uh, I love that this mixed reality, what you said there, Heaney, like this could pioneer a new product category, but that timing is a real question, right? Can they actually beat Cambria to market is, is a real question. I don't think, you know, Tilt 5 is a niche product and I don't think that's a problem. It's all right for something to be a niche product. It doesn't, not everything has to be for the mass market. Obviously, because VR is so new and it's expanding so quickly and, you know, it, it's potential to grow by, you know, 10 or 100 times over the next decade is a very interesting thing to talk about. And we love to discuss that. And it's going to be incredible to watch as VR expands into the mass market. But there's still going to be these niche products that exist and carve out their own little corner of this market. And that's completely fine. And it's normal. And it's what happens in most tech markets. But, you know, on that idea of Cambria, I would come back to what I said in that I really doubt that Cambria will be as affordable as this. And I think there will be a lot of people who want to develop for mixed reality, you know, headsets that pass through the real world with color cameras to your VR-like display that will not be able to afford Cambria or even a lot of people who will watch something that isn't as tied to meta. So I think, you know, even if Lynx ends up being niche, which given its current production timeline, it may have to be if they can't scale that production up this year, it's still going to have a place in the market that even Cambria launching, you know, the week before, if, if Mark Zuckerberg came out and surprise launched Cambria the week before this, I still think it's going to stand on its own. Mm. Very interesting comments. And uh, James asking, this does use UltraLeap, right? You did say that? Yes, they, you can you can see the UltraLeap sensors built into here. There's actually sort of six cameras in the front of this. Two of the cameras are to pass through the real world. 
two of them are for that ultra leap tracking and then the other ones are for the normal positional tracking and that's just because the kind of camera that you want for pass through is actually very different than the kind of camera you want for computer vision mm. interesting all right we ready to move on to google yep let's go talk about these two interesting acquisitions yeah, so Google is acquiring Raxium. That's an AR micro LED display startup. Heaney, what is the significance of this? You're following this area very, very closely. So when we talk about uh, technologies like these and acquisitions, it's very important to make clear to people who may not be aware because of you know heavy marketing from companies that micro LED is a completely new display technology. It is not a variant of LCD, like mini LED. Mini LED is a variant of LCD, nor is it the same thing as an OLED micro display, which is sometimes called micro OLED. And I'll try and see if I can bring up a chart here that describes the difference, though I don't know if I have it in front of me. But essentially what Google is doing is acquiring a company that can provide the kind of displays that will be suitable for AR glasses. LCD and OLED are both too big, and not bright enough and not power efficient enough to be really practical in the kind of AR glasses that everyone wants. The only display technology that's really gonna be capable of this in the short term, or even that we know of in the long term, is micro LED. And no one has yet actually figured out how to mass manufacture micro LED displays at scale in an affordable consumer product, but all of the big tech companies are investing heavily in it. You know, We know Meta has been investing in this for years, Apple has been investing in it for years, Samsung, all of these companies are investing billions because whoever can figure it out first is going to be able to leapfrog all of the other display technologies. And likely, you know, if it's someone like Samsung, it's going to be a huge business opportunity because they're going to do what they always do and sell it to every other company that's interested to make even more money than if they just use it in their own products. You know, this mm. is one of those things that is probably still years out, but if it's important enough that companies like Google will want to have a guaranteed supply early. And, you know, last year, or maybe it was it the year before, we reported on the fact that Meta has secured an agreement with a similar micro LED startup. You know, Google's is called Rax, uh, Raxium. The one that Meta invested in is Plessy. And their deal was that they would have exclusive output from that company for the next, I think it was two years. So Google's going with a slightly different strategy of buying the entire company up, whereas Meta obviously just wanted to make sure they get an exclusive agreement. But in both cases, the companies care about this. And we actually know that Meta has a micro led research division in Ireland, in Cork, Ireland, where they have been researching this for years with the hope to use it in future AR glasses and headsets. One of the things I really wonder about with the differing strategies is how much the antitrust investigations into Meta kind of affect those strategies, right? It's kind of an Apple-like thing at this point to try to buy up the supply, the entire supply going years into the future from a supplier, whereas you know acquiring a company may bring unwanted uh, scrutiny from government regulators. And uh, I really wonder, you know, given given that Meta has so much attention to it, whether that figured into their difference of, of, of approach. I find the chart I was looking for here just so I can kind of describe the key differences in these technologies. So the company that Google's acquired, Raxian, is producing, or to be more accurate, is hoping to produce in the future, micro LED displays. In the Quest 2, you see LCD in headsets like the Quest 1, and in the upcoming PlayStation VR 2, you see OLED. In future headsets, it's expected that quite soon we're going to see micro OLED, which is really just OLED micro displays. It's a slightly different way to make OLED displays that are much smaller. It's For years, we've seen prototypes of VR headsets that use OLED micro displays, and it probably will be quite suitable for VR headsets in the near term. The problem is that the energy efficiency, even though it's better than LCD in cases where you're not using the pixels on all the time, it's still not as good as micro LED. You cannot get the energy efficiency needed for AR glasses of the kind people want from OLED. And of course, the other issue is brightness in that while OLED does improve on LCDs energy efficiency, 
it actually doesn't reach the same brightness. If you're trying to buy a high-end TV right now, you can choose between the best overall image quality, which you'll find in the OLED displays, or the best overall brightness, which you'll find in the LCD. MicroLED is a true kind of unicorn in that it is promises to do all of these things at once. It promises to be extremely bright, to be extremely power efficient, to have a long lifespan, and obviously it's self-emissive like OLED, so you don't have to use a backlight like LCD. You can get infinite contrast and two true blacks, and it will have a you know sub-millisecond response time. It's just a matter of when are we actually going to see this be ready for products, and will any of these companies stop using confusing marketing terms that sound like micro-OLED until we actually get to real micro-OLED? Yeah, James in our comments mentioning micro OLED and micro LED. Are those are those really two different brands, two different types of technology? I'm I didn't really follow that. I mean, I know what I know what you know LED is and what OLED is, but are there really micro versions of both? Yes, yeah, so they are very different technologies. Micro OLED. I really hate that the industry has somehow decided to use such confusingly similar terms, but we are where we are. Micro OLED is just the name for a very small OLED display. They, they're OLED on silicon instead of being the traditional OLED manufacturing technology. They, are, they exist today, micro OLED. They're typically called OLED micro displays to avoid confusion. They exist today. The problem is that they're very expensive. So you can get like certain media viewer headsets that you know they aren't positionally tracked they have a very small field of view and they're very expensive they're designed just for watching movies on and those use oled micro displays it's expected that the apple headset will use oled micro displays again in the center here and it's expected that meta will potentially be using oled micro displays in the quest 3 next year that's obviously just rumor at this point but that is actually as yes, a completely different thing to micro led and when people say an LED display, to be clear, like without the micro, just LED, that's actually just an LCD display that uses <laughs> LED backlights. That is not at all the same thing. A micro, LED, a micro LED, the LEDs are providing the light and the color, like an OLED, except they're not organic. They're just very, very small LEDs. Essentially, there's no magic here. It's just that people are trying to make LEDs that are much, much smaller than any LEDs that we have today in mass manufactured products. And I think the thing that's playing out, I see in our comments, uh, Op Opsies are mentioning that he'd rather have uh, what, that they'd rather have better tracking and wider field of view than a brand speaking new screen tech. And I think that's kind of going to compete with the yields that they're actually able to get out of the manufacturers and their expected market size for these headsets. So, like Keeney, one of the things we've discussed is the Cambria headset that's expected to come from Meta. Meta itself, the, the executives over there have mentioned that they expect that headset to be a lower volume device than the obviously less expensive $300 Quest, which gives them free reign to test out smaller yield components. So things that they can only maybe get out in the millions out of a, out of a manufacturing plant could potentially be used in those devices where maybe you need tens of millions of the same component coming out of uh, the manufacturing for the lower end device. And yeah, I'm, and I'm curious to see when that arrives. Just to respond directly to that comment you brought up, you know, of the, you want you know, wider field of view and better tracking. Micro LED here is not really essential for VR and there's no indication that this will be used in any VR product anytime soon precisely because you can have a lower cost and you don't really need it there. The reason that Google has acquired this company and the reason that Meta has taken a supply agreement on that other company is for AR glasses, because you can't really use these other two display technologies in AR glasses because they're not power efficient enough. They take far too much energy relative to what you want if you want an all day wearable glasses and they're not bright enough compared to the sun. The sun is orders of magnitudes brighter than any LCD or OLED display we have today. If you try to use AR glasses on a sunny day, they will just be completely washed out by the sun. Micro LED can be orders of magnitude brighter than either of these. It's still still none that I've heard of actually gets to the brightness of the sun, but that's no mistake. It's a you know giant nuclear fusion reactor in the sky. It's We can't really get there yet. But <laughs> micro LED promises to be bright enough that it would be usable. 
The other comment I'm going to respond here is people asking, what about mini lead? And this is mini lead is my most hated marketing term. So remember I said before that an LED TV is just an LCD with LED backlights. Mini lead is just an LCD display with lots of little LED backlights. And when I say little, they're still much, much, much larger than micro LED. And they're still only providing the light, not the color. The liquid crystal is still providing the color. But mini LED is just lots of tiny little LEDs, something like, you know, maybe a thousand by 500 or something, a lower resolution in display. But what that means is that you can have, you can kind of do a, a fake cheap approximation of what OLED does in that you can have a very bright part on the right of the screen because all of those little LEDs are lit up while the LEDs on the other side of the screen stay turned off. The problem is that because the resolution of this this mini LED, this min, this matrix of little backlights is nowhere near the resolution of the LCD. You know, it's if you have a 4K LCD that's a 4K mini LED, you're still getting only like less than 1080p backlights. You're going to see a thing called blooming. So if you have a completely black screen, for example, and you just have your little white mouse moving along it on a PC, you'll see that an entire area around the mouse lights up because that's the kind of resolution of the of the leds it's expected that project cambria this meta headset coming later this year will use mini led display but that is still just an lcd with lots of little backlights it's not an oled micro display and it's certainly not micro led i want to very clearly state that micro led does not exist in any consumer product today or any projected consumer product and uh, other than there are some sort of very large TVs from the likes of Samsung that cost tens of thousands of dollars, but that's stretching the definition of micro LED there because because TVs are so large, are they really micro LEDs at that point or are they just kind of smaller LEDs that we have available today? Those kind of tech could not be scaled down to smartphone and VR headset style panels just because those LEDs are still far too big, but they work fine on a 100-inch TV. Hops are making the comment that we need to nerf the sun. I like that uh, that sentiment. We could always talk to Starlink uh, and see if uh, they're going to put enough satellites up there to uh, block out the sun. Are so we ready to move on net. to the next subject? Yep. Let's move on to the finals. Oh, no. Sorry. We have to talk about the Snapchat acquisition as well. Yeah, so Snap is acquiring NextMind. Snap is the company behind Snapchat, of course, as well as their Snap Spectacles glasses. They're acquiring a brain-computer interface company called NextMind for future augmented reality glasses. We obviously follow BCI's brain-computer interfaces pretty closely, Heaney, but we had some debate about how relevant they are to our audience. Heaney, why don't you break down what this could be used for and why we kind of draw that line between what VR is and what BCI can bring to it. So The Verge has reported on this uh, this acquisition, Snapchat buying this company, NextMind, as specifically being for their future AR glasses ambitions. A lot of the time when we talk about AR glasses and the companies that are expected to, to be big in the space, people tend to forget about Snapchat, but Snapchat has already launched three glasses products not with a display, they're just kind of camera glasses. And its fourth product is in the hands of developers right now. And the, the, you know these are all marketed as spectacles. And these spectacles actually do have an AR display. They are AR glasses with tracking. Why can't I find the image? I don't know why. We'll just go to a blank image. The a spokesman apparently told a spokesperson, sorry, apparently told The Verge that this acquisition, Snapchat acquiring NextMind is a long-term research bet with no specific technology yet intended to ship in products. But you may be wondering, what is the relevance between BCI, you know, brain reading technology and AR glasses? Why is Snapchat acquiring a mind reading headband that, you know, this company launched a product, a developer kit for $400. You put it on the back of your head and you can kind of read uh, emotional and mental state for at this point still just development and research purposes. The idea is that say you have AR glasses on and you're walking down the street or you're on a bus or you're on a train or wherever in public, you don't, you can't use voice. Voice can't be the input choice of default or even really be relied on at all because nobody wants to dictate a private message out in the middle of a bus. No one wants to kind of say, 
No one even really wants to talk to a digital assistant on a bus. Maybe a few people do, but certainly not a crowded bus and certainly not very loud. So there obviously are other input options, such as you could use your hands floating in the air and type on a virtual keyboard, but no one really wants to do that all day either. You don't want to kind of be walking along in the street and type like this in the same way that, you know, on a phone, you can just very effortlessly tap a screen. Maybe smartphones will continue to use for quite a long time and be the input method for AR glasses, but eventually, and even in the short term, people are going to want a dedicated input system. And one of the most promising ideas would be that these glasses can just read your mind. The idea that you just think about what you know message you want to send or what application you want to open or what you want to happen, and then it happens. And you know you don't have to say it out loud. You don't have to wave your hands around in the air like a crazy person. You just think about it. Meta had its own project to achieve this, a research project that it announced in 2017. At the time, a lot of people you know noted that it sounded like science fiction. And their goal was a system capable of typing 100 words per minute from your brain, which is a pretty decent speed for typing on a keyboard. Last year in summer, Meta announced that they were canceling that project to instead work on their wrist device, which we've discussed in this show, where it intercepts the signals going from your brain to your hand along the wrist so they can do kind of perfect, very precise hand tracking. So it's interesting that Snap has decided that they want to try this approach and see whether it will work, whether it is viable. And maybe they run into the same issues that made Meta conclude it's not viable, or maybe they managed to get it to work. But it's a promising but very long-term research bet. Mm -hmm. Any comments there that we should respond to? There's obviously a lot going on with BCI. I remember I did uh, an interview with uh, OpenBCI, I think it was, to talk about their work with the Valve Index. And as I understand it, that's a, a many thousands of dollars product to get this BCI attached to a valve index. And then to read all of those signals that are coming out of the brain, you need uh, you need some kind of software platform to do the analysis. And uh, it's just so expensive right now. But working back from those brain reading kits, they're going to find out what's the sort of minimum amount of hardware we need to put on the head in order to get uh, reliable signals that'll actually help us enhance your VR or AR experience. And I, I don't know, I, 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 always, I wonder, I would love to understand over at Meta how they decided, like how did that decision-making process go where they actually decided to abandon the more invasive work uh, actually reading near the head and focus on the wrist work? Like how did that decision actually get made? Because uh, that's a tough decision to actually realize you've got to focus on that thing. Heaney just walked out of my out of the room here. He, he walked through a wall like uh, like in the movie Ghost or something. Quite an experience. Looking at our comments here. Oh, and he's back. Just lost connection for a few seconds there. Yeah, so I think a lot of people are mentioning that you know creators and content creators have tried. The, a lot of these BCI products, you know, there's also Neurosity, and we've actually seen some very interesting applications out of it, but it's still not anywhere near the point where you could use it for precise text input. We're still in the very early days where this kind of tech can do very basic things like, you know, you could judge between happy and sad po uh, uh, sentiment, and you can kind of do some very basic understanding of a person's general general thoughts, not something as specific as typing, but you could maybe do something like show them uh, two options and decide even without the gaze tracking, which of these two options they're choosing. But again, you know, eye tracking already does that. It's still unclear how any company can in any short term ship this in a real consumer product. I don't know how off topic we want to go here, Heaney, but I sent you that article uh, and the study that I read where there was a person who was completely locked in. They had no body movement uh, at all. And they basically uh, used a BCI to train that person to be able to communicate directly uh, using the BCI, even though they had no other way of communicating with the outside world. And I think, you know, when you, if you go read that study or find that article, it's really mind blowing blowing and hard for us to grasp at this point uh how fundamentally it changes uh learning and understanding when 
you've got um, when you've got the feedback loop that tight between giving input from a BCI and actually getting output from the brain, you know, where do thoughts actually begin becomes one of those ongoing questions that's that's probably hurting a couple of people's brains out there listening to this. And, uh, you know, it's one of these areas we're going to have to keep an eye on over the length of time. Are there any comments we should respond to, Heaney? Yeah, so I was just thinking of what you're saying there in terms of in the near term, there definitely could be applications for people who have reduced mobility, people who are disabled before this technology is capable of text, you know, someone who, for example, can't use a controller, is there a near term where they can move around in virtual worlds and interact with things just by thinking without even it being precise enough to know exactly what they're thinking? Is there, you know, a potential for things like emotional state to be an important way for people who are nonverbal to communicate their kind of current mental state? There's lots of interesting applications that, you know, I, I've kind of maybe dismissed that are possible before we get to the point where it can precisely say, you know, what is the exact sentence you're thinking about? Mm. Are we ready to move on to the last subject here? Yeah, I think we should. Let's talk about that PlayStation VR information we got from GDC because, you know, it's such an exciting headset. Yeah, so I had uh, Alex and Skiva, uh, who uh, were at GDC. I had them in our studio last week, uh, wrapping up GDC. And uh, I don't think it got captured by the camera over there, because. Uh, but I had Alex sitting over here, and I was joking with him, like, he he exhausted, they exhausted every avenue they could come up with to try to get in the room with PSVR 2, and they couldn't do it. And yeah, we obviously tried as well to see if we could somehow snag a demo with this thing at this point. And we, we couldn't manage it. But like the the, the reaction Alex had uh, was just so comical of just he doesn't want to hear me teasing him that he might have walked by the room that this was actually being demoed in and no one was the wiser. And he could have <laughs> been like 15 feet away from this headset and not actually known it. Um, yeah. So Chet, formerly of Valve, made this comment that uh, he tried uh, v- PSVR 2 and had, quote, one of those moments where you know where the world just feels different when you return. And I have had a couple of those demos uh, over the years. Uh, My first demo that I can think of that was like that. No, I guess I had a couple. I had early, I had the original duct tape rift kit uh, around 2012. And then around uh, 2014, 2015 timeframe, I got to try the room scale Vive pre, pre, pre. Uh, when it was being shipped out by Valve. And I remember, I I still distinctly remember the effect of watching someone else go through a Vive demo and then stopping themselves within inches from a wall because the chaperone system had come up right in front of them and warned them that they were about to walk into a wall. And me sort of uh, ingesting some of the fear I needed to have of how slow I needed to move through the VR headset to ensure I didn't walk straight into a wall. And uh, I've had demos since then, uh, like the standalone Quest, uh, when it was still going by a code name, and then next year having controllers. And uh, I've even had demos since then, uh, a couple that I can't really talk about just yet, that always show us a, a future look at some things we really fundamentally need in VR. And I guess, you know, with PSVR 2, what features do you think Chet saw that he's referring to that, that really gave him a glimpse of the future? See, I don't think it has to be one specific feature. It could just be all of these things coming together in a package. You know, this idea that PSVR 2 could be using great lenses. You know, Sony is a company that has a lot of experience with optics from its cameras division it can put in you know the playstation vr1 lenses were state of the art they managed to achieve a lot of the things that were only thought to be possible from fresnels without having those trade-offs that fresnels have with the psvr2 it could be the fact that you have this high dynamic range oled display a great inside eye tracking system a experience that is you know I don't know what demo he saw, but Sony is 
we talked about the fact last week that Sony has sent out over 2,000 developer kits. So this probably isn't some Hello World demo. This probably isn't some you know basic cartoon scene you would see in a Quest. There's probably a high fidelity demo powered by the PlayStation 5, which you know is just a lot more powerful than the processor in a Quest 2 and can deliver a fidelity that the Quest 2 simply can't. So if you get that great HDR OLED display and a high fidelity experience with good inside out tracking and controllers that have you know great HD haptics with uh, triggers that are adaptive uh, f- to the resistance they provide, with a headset that has all the fundamentals right and that you know can provide its own face haptics and the the dynamic foveated rendering, which we'll discuss shortly here, means that it can provide you know a, a high resolution view of a high fidelity world. It could just be all of these things coming together in one. Because even in PC VR, we're still not at the point where at any wide scale of content there is dynamic foveated rendering available still the headsets that are mostly used both the valve index and the quest are lcds which means that you know the contrast is going to be much more washed out than oled they're not going to have the true color black so you never feel like you're truly in darkness the fact that the the psvr2 has that high dynamic range oled display to me is what would just be completely stunning compared to what we're seeing on pc today So Artful making this comment asking, I can't see what head haptics would be used for. And I'm going to go back to my my favorite sign of experience in VR, which is bow and arrow, right? So back in 2016, uh, Valve released the lab set of experiments, and in it is this bow and arrow, a long bow experience. And those original Vive wands had this great haptic effect where you could pull back the bow and really feel like you've got a string in your hand. Well, the DualSense controllers on the PS5 have these resistive triggers that could take that to the next level. And that same feature is going to be included in the controllers for the PSVR 2. But now imagine you're pulling back this bow and you're aiming it, you're aiming your arrow at someone and you release it and it flies at someone and then someone else shoots an arrow back at you and it lodges right in your forehead, right? It, it's pointing, you, you can look up and see an arrow coming out of your head. And for every second that it's in there, your vision tunnels a little bit, it throbs, you feel your head throbbing because you've got an arrow sticking out of your head. So you reach up, grab the arrow, pull it out and throw it away, or you, you knock it back onto your bow and you start firing again, right? You could actually feel the pain of that arrow sticking into your head with those those head haptics and you could build entirely different game experiences than we have today off of it and that's just one little example of of how it might work people might honestly want to turn that off in some for some people but it still could be the key to completely new experiences heaney i mean i would say it doesn't even need to be if you're shot in the head i would see say if you're shot in general in a game the head haptics is going to work because you know if you don't have a chest piece like you know, tactical haptics or, uh, sorry, not tactical haptics, it be haptics, which is obviously something that only a very small niche of people are going to be able to afford and is only supported in very few games. Just the fact that when you get shot, you're going to feel something in your body. I think you're going to, it doesn't need to be on the chest. It being on the head will still give you that feeling of something has actually hit me. There's obviously also the possibility that if these head haptics are precise, if this is linear actuators like or what were on those Vive ones, like are in the controllers, if that's on the headset, then they can do a really kind of precise low level vibration for something like driving a car. So you're in a vehicle and you go from smooth asphalt to, you know, off road and you start to kind of feel it in your head as the, as it physically moves, you're going to actually feel a connection to the ground. There's a lot of potential here, but as always, what developers are capable of doing when they're given a new tool like this always seems to outshine the predictions of what comes before. So I would say I am very confident that developers will come up with creative ideas to use this that we haven't even thought of yet. Yeah, I can't wait. Any final comments there that we should respond to before we wrap this up today? Well, I think we should go on to the uh, last piece of sort of news with the PSVR, the fact that the foveated rendering claim. So, uh, Oh, that's right, a, yeah. Yeah, so at a... Um, a unity of panel at GDC, they claim that the GPU frame times are 3.6 times faster when using foveated rendering with eye tracking, though interestingly they say it's 2.5 times faster 
when using foveated rendering alone. Now, I assume that that means fixed foveated rendering, which is used on Quest, wherein the peripheral of the lens is rendered in a lower resolution. So it doesn't change on where you look. And dynamic foveated rendering, which is, you know, the foveated rendering with eye tracking, is something we haven't seen on any headset outside of professional headsets like the Vive Pro Eye. And it's not something that's, you know, supported in the vast, vast, vast majority of Steam VR. It's not something that's on Quest, obviously, because there is no Quest with eye tracking yet. So that is a really extraordinary claim of 3.6 times faster. Though, if it's, if even using non eye tracked foveated rendering is 2.5 times faster i'm skeptical of how that can be true you don't see those sort of gains 2.5 times faster on quest although you know there's a very different kind of gpu between you know the tiled render that you see in a mobile chip and the desktop style amd gpu in the playstation vr2 so that could be possible but what that says to me is that the gains from eye tracking aren't actually as big as we think. It seems that you know doing foveated rendering in general at this stage provides quite a big performance boost, but that's not as much of an improvement of turning eye tracking on and off than I expected, though obviously that's going to have none of the trade-offs of fixed foveated rendering if it's done right. Because with fixed foveated rendering, if you look in your periphery, it will look lower resolution. And as you move your head around and things kind of transition from the center of the lens to the edge of the lens, you'll notice that kind of pixelation on the corners. Whereas if the eye tracked foveated rendering is done right, it shouldn't be noticeable or at least should only be noticeable in very few cases. So that's actually very promising. And it shows you what we can expect from future PC headsets whenever Steam VR manages to integrate this. And from future mobile chips where, you know, performance was never really going to be PSVR 2's problem. The PlayStation 5 is a very powerful machine compared to something like a Quest. But when we get this kind of technology on standalone, if it can do those same sort of gains, that's going to change fundamentally the type of games that are possible. Whereas on PlayStation VR 2, all it's doing is making the same games that were already possible perform a lot better or, you know, be able to have a lot higher fidelity graphics. Mm -hmm. any final comments there this was a yeah i'm really curious to see the eye tracking is such a difficult issue there because every eye tracking i've used so far i've had to train the system where my eyes can move uh basically before using it so they tell you look at a target up here look at a target over here look at a target down here and look at a target over here and then uses those as kind of the reference points for all the future tracking inside the headset and that is a huge barrier to putting the headset on more people. Uh, you, you know, you have to put that calibration step in for every new person that puts on the headset. And that's not, that's not really going to scale well. So whether and how Sony works this out and the other manufacturers that are exploring uh, eye tracking, how they work this out is going to be a fundamental thing. And it's one of the reasons why we've waited this long to have eye tracking in a very low cost vr system is this this whole step of calibration so i'm really curious to see where sony lands on that so i talked to toby a few years ago which is the company that is now confirmed to be the supplier of the eye tracking and from what i understand calibration is not going to go away anytime soon it is highly highly likely i would say almost certain that yes every time a new person puts on this headset they're going to have to go through that calibration step I'm not sure I agree with you there's a huge barrier though. I agree it is a barrier, but at the end of the day, it is a five second step if you do it right. If it's just, you know, look at this, then look at this, then look at this, then look at this. Yes, it's annoying if you want to quickly pass the headset around, but I don't think it's a deal breaker for what it does offer. One of the interesting things I noted from this talk was that the, apparently this SDK provides not just gaze position, so what you're looking at, but it also provides pupil diameter and blink states. So the blink state is obviously useful for 
uh, social VR. So you can see when a person really blinks and potentially even winks at you. You could also do some very interesting things like you could, when someone blinks, you could kind of load to a different scene if in some sort of games that want to be zany and mess with the player. But that pupil diameter one is very interesting because that's not something that I think we've seen yet. And that presents kind of very interesting privacy questions in the sense that what useful purpose does that really serve for games? Maybe it provides a little bit to social VR, but what that really could tell you is it could tell advertisers how engaged you are with certain content. Yeah, and Guy Godin in our comments suggesting that in theory, you can recognize the user from the eye features. So it could be an authentication step and it could be done just once per headset, right? Like, so if you have remembered what those eye features were the next time that person puts on the headset, uh, maybe it remembers uh, and prompts you to log in or something like that. And I did put that question to Facebook uh, a couple years ago, whether you think headsets are going to need to recognize their users. And I think the the consensus or the, the view of the person I talked to was that, yes, headsets will kind of need to authenticate and recognize who is wearing them over time. So it'll be really, Guy mentioning that there are privacy issues with saving and recognizing the user. And uh, Guy has on multiple occasions pointed out that there's no tracking of any kind in virtual desktop, specifically because they're, he's that resistant to that sort of functionality. Yeah, I think it's important to note that, you know, this idea of authenticating through the iris is not hypothetical. That's how Magic Leap and HoloLens 2 already work today. You log in like that. I don't, you know, to be clear, we weren't suggesting that every time you put the headset on, you'll have to configure. It's just that, say your friend has come around and you want to very quickly show them this cool headset you've got for Christmas and you put it on their head. And instead of just jumping in and playing, they have to go through that first step of eye calibration. I don't think it's the end of the world, but it is an extra barrier that makes VR you know, a little bit more effort than before. But I think we can all agree that for what that provides you, it is worth it. Yeah, I'm thinking of that. Uh, Artful made a comment there that made me think of my minority report. And uh, maybe in the future, I'm going to need to have a second set of eyeballs that I can swap out when I, when I need to go into private user mode. All right. Uh, thank Lachlan. you so much. <laughs> what was that comment? So I was just saying, James O'Loughlin, I think obviously the, you know, the stream is a little bit delayed. So James O'Loughlin was pointing out that same thing that Magic Leap and HoloLens already have, iris unlocking. That is already how you can sign into those headsets. And I expect that is how login will work in the same sense that on a smartphone today, login works with your fingerprint or your face ID. Headsets, it will be your iris. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be. Well, thank you so much for tuning in with us this week. We've got a lot of great content on UploadVR.com. And be sure to check out our GDC wrap-ups uh, from Alex and Skiva on the ground at GDC, checking out all the AR and VR content out there uh, and the hardware out there uh, at GDC for us. And thank you so much for tuning in this week. We've got uh, the Gamescast that should be back on Thursday. And uh, we'll be back next Tuesday at the same time to bring you in our stream. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in the future.